Hey, what's going on, folks? Welcome back to the Parkside Merchant channel. Uh, we are now here, folks, in the final installment in my video series going through the first 11 vintage Yu-Gi-Oh sets and talking about my favorite top 10 cards from each of the sets. Um, this has been a very interesting journey, guys. I got to tell you, I mean, I, I've been able to kind of go through each of the old sets again, uh, kind of card by card and decide for myself what, what were some of my favorites from each of the sets. So kind of a very fun exercise to go through as a collector. There's a lot of this stuff that you forget about over the years uh, and a lot of these sets that just sort of fade into your memory, so to speak. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff that just sticks in your mind, right? Things that you remember very distinctly and very vividly. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of cards here that uh, certainly were, were pretty well stuck in my memory over the past, uh, you know, 15 or 20 years or whatever. So uh, I think we're all up to Ancient Sanctuary here. I've done all the other sets up to this over the past two weeks or so. Uh, now finally have reached the final uh, set from the first 11. Um, I should say with Ancient Sanctuary, I honestly don't even remember. I may not have actually purchased any of this stuff firsthand when I was a kid. I remember seeing some of it, but I don't know that I bought a bunch of this. I was kind of getting out of Yu-Gi-Oh right around the time this started ramping up. Uh, and there were a couple other things I was buying at the time instead of this stuff. Like there were a couple of tins and things that I was going after. So I just, some of these cards I don't remember very distinctly. So I got to be honest, this is a little bit, uh, I don't want to say it's past my time, but it kind of is because I didn't play a lot of this stuff. And by the time Ancient Sanctuary was getting around, like people weren't dueling as much at my school. I wasn't really dueling as actively. And so, so I can't say that I played this stuff or that I'm as familiar with this stuff as I, as I was with obviously many of the other sets that we talked about here over the past several videos. But that said, I am still a collector and I've been buying a lot of cards over the past six or seven months. And I've seen plenty of Ancient Sanctuary stuff come across the desk here, so to speak. And I've gotten to learn a lot more about the set over the past several months. So still thought it would be worthwhile to round this out, put the final kind of installment here on the series uh, and give you my take on the stuff that I think is the most interesting from this set. So we'll go ahead and just dive in. As always, I'm not ranking these in terms of value or collectability or in terms of like playability. It's just the stuff that I happen to think is the most interesting or fun from each of the sets. So let's start off with Curse of Anubis. Um, for those of you that follow the channel, if you saw my video on Dark Crisis, you know that I'm not really a huge fan of the, um, you know, Judgment of Anubis card, but this thing certainly reminds me of that card which I think did make my top 10 for Dark Crisis. So I'm kind of tossing this into the mix just because it looks like some familiar cards. There's like a lot of these Anubis-themed cards out there. And so I think it's a little bit of the artwork. It's a little bit of the connection to some of the other sets um, that I think I like the, about this card. And that's what draws me to it. I don't really know how playable this stuff was or like how useful it was, but presumably had some playability to it. Um, and was a useful card uh, for people that used this stuff a long time ago. Next up, we have the card uh, seven. I think the only reason that I'm interested in this card at all basically is because uh, it's just a number, which is unusual. There aren't a whole lot of other cards to my knowledge that are just a single digit, just one letter or a number. Um, so that stands out, right? It's a standout card, standout artwork, pretty unusual. Uh, and for that reason, I think it's a, a top 10 contender for me as somebody that's like not intimately familiar with this set. Okay, next up we have the Goblin Thief. So I was looking through this set and this thing caught my eye. This was the kind of card that I would have played a lot as a kid. And I don't actually remember having any of these, but I always liked cards that had a very simple, very positive, uh, very easy to just, easy to work kind of an effect. And this thing is about as cut and dry and simple as it gets, right? Inflict 500 points of damage on your opponent and then boost your life points by 500. So, I don't know, seems like in a certain circumstance that could be particularly useful. Uh, not the worst thing to probably have in a deck. So this would have been the kind of card that I would have liked to play when I was uh, playing a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh back in the day. So that, that's why it makes my top 10. On top of the fact that it's a goblin card, and a lot of these goblin cards I always find pretty entertaining. Okay, next up we have uh, Moki Moki. Um, I like this card just because it's kind of funny. It's unusual, terrible stats, um, 
just a simple artwork, just like about as bare bones as a card could possibly get, right? It's There's nothing fancy going on here whatsoever. Um, and for that reason alone, I think it's a standout card. You don't see a lot of this in vintage Yu-Gi-Oh, whatever this thing is. Next, we have the end of Anubis. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's got a lot going for it, right? It's a good uh, artwork there. Um, as the secret here from the set, it's got interesting stats, that kind of contrast, 2,500 and a zero, always stands out. So I guess it's kind of self-explanatory for me, but secret rare, um, interesting stats, interesting effect. So I guess it's in my top 10 for the set. Uh, next up, we have the Sanctuary in the Sky. Um, Got to be honest, I didn't really remember this card as a kid, but looking at it in hindsight, I kind of like it. Very unusual, sort of peculiar artwork. Reminds me a lot of the uh, Miyazaki Castle in the Sky for folks that are big anime fans. So it's kind of got that angle going in its favor to a degree. Um, and it's just kind of a fun, unusual artwork, right? It's got some Greco-Roman kind of things going on there. There's like a Colosseum. All kind of harkens the same sorts of themes in my mind, so... Very cool card for the, for some of those reasons. Okay, next up we have Mazera Deville. Um, this card, the only reason I have this in the top ten, is because this is to me the like icon or the stamp that marked the end of my Yu-Gi-Oh collection journey to a degree. This thing is like this feels modern to me, which. For folks that know Yu-Gi-Oh, right, there's been thousands of cards that have been printed since this thing was printed. But when I see this thing pop up in a binder, I'm like, ooh, I've got something modern here, right? This thing feels modern to me. And for that reason, I think it's important for me as a collector because it's kind of a bookend, if you will. If my Garnetia Elephantis cards are sort of on one end of the spectrum as like the most OG sort of original, nostalgic, ancient stuff that I've got in my collection. This thing is on the other end. It's, it's the other bookend, if you will. So I do like this card a lot, but to me it's sort of as a symbol of the end of my Yu-Gi-Oh! collection journey when I was uh, originally into the hobby. Next up we have the Stone Statue of the Aztecs. Uh, here's why I like this card. If you follow my channel, you could probably guess. I was a big fan of the Battle City Tournament. And I was an even bigger fan of Seeker, the rare hunter, whose deck was just filled with Exodia parts. And this card obviously played well with that particular strategy, which was just to play defense until you could draw all the Exodia pieces. And this thing is obviously a good defensive card. So I liked that duel a lot. I really liked the duel between Yugi and the Seeker. Uh, I liked the Seeker's character. I just thought it was so clever that they had a character that was literally like a guy that was exploiting the rules of Yu-Gi-Oh and using counterfeits and stuff like that just to cheat his way to a win with Exodia parts. It's like, when you saw that guy, when you were a kid, you were like, wow, this guy's a boss because he's got all these Exodia parts. And this card was like up there for me as like a big Battle City card because this guy played it. And um, it was cool from that duel. Okay, next up, number two, we've got the Gear Golem. The Moving Fortress. I learned about this card, actually, in a previous video that I did uh, about the most difficult cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! to grade PSA 10. And it happens that this particular card you're looking at, uh, at least at the time at which I did the previous video, had a PSA 10 pop of four cards, folks. That's right, four cards out of a total uh, submission pool of 29. So it's not a very popular card, I guess, because it's Ancient Sanctuary. Not a lot of people submit Ancient Sanctuary. But there is something to be said for the fact that there are only four PSA 10s of this thing in existence. That's like Black Lotus level, Mickey Mantle level, right? Single digit volume. You don't see that a lot. Most Yu-Gi-Oh cards have at least double digits of PSA 10s. There's only several that have single digits. And it, it's when they do have single digits, they're usually very valuable. Not this one so much, because obviously there's a lot of sealed Ancient Sanctuary out there still. Not a lot of people really like this set very much, so they probably don't bother to grade their stuff from the set. But uh, I like this card. Uh, the stats are very intriguing. A lot of, lot of defense there. Um, and the effect is also very intriguing. It's kind of gimmicky. Um, and I imagine was pretty playable for some people back in the day. Okay, here we go. My number one favorite card from Ancient Sanctuary, folks. Uh, this is the final card in this entire series that I'm doing. It's the enemy controller. Um, 
I think simple reasons I liked this. I do remember it from the series. Uh, it was used in one of the final rounds there at Battle City. This was a Kaiba card, which obviously Kaiba cards are often very popular. I was a big Kaiba fan, so I liked kind of that angle that it's got going for it. From a PSA perspective, this is another card that only has a pop of about four cards, I think, for PSA 10. And it's got a very small pool, only 23 that have been submitted to PSA. So um, it's sort of got a very high degree of rarity. It's up there with that other guy we just uh, showed, the Gear Golem here. So I think for that reason, it's got some nostalgia power for me because I do remember it from the series. Uh, and it's a fun card, interesting effect, and... Uh, very rare, probably very valuable. If a PSA 10 of these goes for sale, I imagine it's going to sell. It's probably going to sell for a lot of dollars. So um, that's got that sort of collector value thing going in its favor. So that's all, folks. We are now all done with our series here of these videos, which means for some of you, you're going to be disappointed that it's all over. Uh, for others, you're going to be relieved that we can move on to different content and talk about different things. So... Uh, let me know in the comments, what did you think of my ranking for Ancient Sanctuary? Again, bear in mind, this is not a set that I am intimately familiar with. I did not play a lot of these cards. I was kind of done with Yu-Gi-Oh! by the time this thing hit the shelves. So uh, just take that with a grain of salt and for what it's worth as you comment on my reactions to Ancient Sanctuary. So that's all, folks. Once again, thanks for watching. This is the Parkside Merchants channel, and we'll see you next time.